Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Badcast. Today, we are glad to welcome back Dr. Foster Rodriguez from Johns Hopkins Hospital. We are happy to announce that he is kicking off today an 11 part series of neuropathology lectures covering a broad range of topics. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for your time and effort. We appreciate it very much. So, his first topic of this 11 part series today is Tumor effective pseudoneoplastic lesions. Hope you had a chance to go over the digital slides that were uploaded. As always, please feel free to post your comments or questions on Facebook Live and YouTube chat windows. Dr. Rodriguez will be happy to answer them at the end of the session. With that, over to Dr. Rodriguez now. All right, so uh, welcome everybody, uh, and thank you for uh, participating. Uh, I've noticed some comments pre-lecture that I have received that, uh, so um, I, I hope this is going to be useful. I, I'm gonna start this topic, to my factors to the plastic lesions. I use this term very broadly. Um, so basically, it can be so, lesions that can be, that we tend to see that are non-neoplastic, that we tend to see in, surgical neuropathology. So some of them may be tumefactive by imaging or, tumef or, or be pseudoneoplastic by pathology. So I use it very broadly in this sense. And it's not all encompassing. There's a lot of lesions that we see in daily practice that can be mistaken for tumor or one way or the other. So I'm just showing you some representative examples of problems that I have encountered either in my daily practice or in my consultation practice. So I hope you find it useful. Uh, as in uh, the format is gonna be similar to other lectures that we have done before in PathCast, which includes a presentation of cases. All these slides are in virtual slides. I'm gonna show you exactly those slides. I'm going to complement with some stains or some additional cases that are uh, educational. And at the end, we're going to have a multiple choice uh, questions uh, that are representative of what we have discussed. So uh, please pay attention and uh, so now we'll start. The first case, we'll go straight to it, is a 57-year-old woman that developed facial droop and stroke-like symptoms, it has a history of uh, ovarian cancer. We'll move to the virtual slide now. And this is a slide, and hopefully you had a chance to take a look at it uh, in advance. And we're going, here is the abnormality, a low power. It's good to look at, at these lesions in low power and knowing, it when, particularly when you have a, a large piece like this, where you can have an, a grasp of what is being involved. Here's something that is very useful just by starting is that this is your gray matter and it's essentially normal. And then you have another piece where you don't see probably neurons or anything like that. And therefore we are dealing with a lesion that is restricted to the white matter. And these are problematic lesions that we encounter uh, in uh, consultation. This was actually a surgical specimen. So uh, many of these come with a diagnosis of preoperative diagnosis to exclude or concern of excluding a neoplastic process. We look around, it's very cellular, but if you go on high power, what we see, we see all these cells here that have vacuolated cytoplasm, little in the way of atypia, and you can gather that these are macrophages. Sprinkle around the, are these cells, which are astrocytes. These are reactive astrocytes. And you can see that they are keeping their spaces. They are evenly distributed. They are not aggregating or anything. That's also something very typical of reactive fibrillar gliosis, secondary to many disease processes. We keep looking around. We see some of these macrophages are more obvious around the vessels. You have also a sprinkling of chronic inflammation and lymphocytes. <laughs> A 
So we are dealing what sometimes many of these in surgical specimens, when I particularly when I have very little in the way of uh, clinical uh, property of clinical information, um, we tend to term this macrophage rich lesion with a comment. And the main thing there is that you're telling them this is not a tumor. Um, so that's the first step. Then we do some special stains. And in this context of macrophage rich lesion, one of the main the stains that are the most useful is the neurofilament protein stain. It's something that I recommend you to use many times in these cases. And we, if we go on high power here, we're going in the air of abnormality, very cellular. And you can say, well, yeah, there's a decrease in axonal density, slight decrease in axonal density, but they are relatively preserved. So all these linear arrays of axons tell you that the axons are there, and what is being lost is the myelin. So you can complement this with a luxol fast blue or another stain that you may use in your laboratory for myelin. But the comment here will be that there is relative axonal preservation. Sometimes when these lesions are acute and uh, they, you can have some axonal injury, and there is certainly so a small degree of axonal loss, but it's relatively preserved. If this was a, an infarct, for example, which is one of the main considerations in the differential diagnosis or an abscess, all these axons will be essentially gone. So this tells you that you are dealing with a demyelinating process. Sometimes macrophages in h &E sections of the CNS uh, can be difficult to uh, assess. You can, depending on the preparation, you may have um, the, cytoplasmic, the, the cytoplasmic quality may not be very evident, and you may need to do uh, immunostain. And here is a CD68, and you can see this is the white matter, and on top you see the gray matter. It's essentially normal. You may have a, a slight spillage of macrophages into the gray matter and microglial activation, but the disease process is mostly predominantly confined to the white matter. And you see it here, this is your CD68. And you can see an accentuation around perivascular areas, but also diffusely infiltrating other areas. As you know, CD68 is not the, it's not 100% specific. It's a marker of lysosome. So sometimes you may have tumors that have an increased lysosome content in which CD68 will be positive. That includes gliomas the, and a variety of other tumors. So occasionally you may want to do a more specific macrophage stain. A commonly used one is CD163, and we have it here. And it's also positive. So this is more specific for macrophages. And you can see it's, it's a little bit stronger actually than CD68 in many instances. So you see you have a dense infiltrate. When you have an infiltrate like this of macrophages, and again, you're considering a tumor, whether the, you know, you're being pressed by uh, the neurosurgeon in a frozen section uh, or after, when you're seeing a high density of macrophages, you have to stay away and really consider the possibility of something non-neoplastic. And most of the time, that's going to be the leading consideration in a case like this. Here is your K67, sometimes it's useful. The caveat is that inflammatory cells can label with K67, but you see here the K67 labeling index is very, very, very low. And for this amount of cellularity, if you were concerned about a tumor, you will be concerned about a high-grade tumor given the cellularity, but then you have a K67 that is very low. Again, in individual instances, inflammatory cells may label, but uh, here this also supports that probably we're not dealing with a neoplastic lesion. So the diagnosis here is, this is how I phrase it in a typical surgical neuropathology case, macrophage rich lesion um, consistent with demyelinating disease. 
So there's a variety of, of lesions that are non-neoplastic uh, that can affect the CNS. The malignating disease is the uh, chief consideration because this can present with a preoperative consideration of tumor. There's a variety of leukoencephalopathies that can be toxic, vascular, metabolic. There's a lot of cases. Some of them may be inherited. There are some destructive but non-infection, non-infectious causes like subacute infarct. This will involve many times the gray matter. That's something that is very useful. Infectious, uh, a variety of infections can do that. Then you have to start thinking of also some uh, uh, neoplastic processes like uh, true histiocytosis and neoplasms. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is lymphoma that has been treated with steroids prior to biopsy. That can give you a sheet of macrophages that is indistinguishable uh, from many other uh, macrophage rich lesions that we deal with. So there, the history is very important. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of idiopathic lesions that we still don't know what they are, but the more that we use uh, more stronger diagnostic tools, we learn a bit more about them. So the malignating disease is usually something, as I mentioned, that is predominantly affects the white matter. Uh, this is a case of multiple sclerosis. One caveat here is that uh, it's for in particular in surgical specimens, it's not wise to use the term multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a, is a clinical pathologic term. It is, uh, you need to see more than one side and more than one lesion in, in time. There's strict neurologic criteria for it. So calling it demyelination is very useful. That by itself tells a lot. You don't need to go beyond that trying to classify the lesion in surgical specimens. Here you see these subtle plaques around the, the white matter uh, that are multiple, particularly around the ventricles, as highly characteristic of MS. Uh, but really, MS very rarely gets biopsied. So if it's classic, it gets treated from the neurological side. The neurologists are very keen into identifying it. The lesions that we see in surgical specimens are the ones that make masses like this in which there is a concern that this could be tumor or something else and those are the ones that we that we tend to see uh in in these specimens some clues preoperative in the imaging are that what is called an incomplete ring of enhancement this is different from what you see for example with a glioblastoma in which you have a very thick complete ring of enhancement but these incomplete rings of enhancement are highly typical of tumefactive demyelination what you see, like I showed you earlier, uh, dense cellular infiltrate of macrophages with spar a sparkle of, of astrocytes, chronic inflammation that is perivascular. Sometimes you can have a other uh, what's called Grusfeld cells, which are have these fragmented nuclei or granular mitosis. It's important to recognize this as a common feature in many demyelinating processes and not to be scared uh, and go in the direction of tumor just because you're seeing mitosis. They are very unique. They have this really delicate uh, chromosomes and a, and a little bit of a halo around. That is completely compatible with a reactive process. C68, uh, evenly distributed DFAP positive cells. Looks so fast blue is a myelin stain, which is turned very strongly blue in the white matter and normal white matter. Here you see that it's lost and you can start seeing actually in the cytoplasm of the macrophages, uh, Gobbling, that are gobbling up this myelin, this dust of, of blue, which is also highly characteristic, relatively axonal, relative axonal preservation. Uh, so that is what you see with tumefactive demyelination. We'll move to the uh, next case, which is case two, a 64 year old woman with a left parietal occipital lesion. And is, here is what you're seeing, another cellular lesion. Of course, when you see it at low power, you start thinking, could this be neoplastic? Is the first thing that comes to mind. Many of these uh, surgical specimens, that's the main thing that, that you want to consider first. And we start seeing evenly sp spaced astrocytes. Again, that's what we call a subacute gliosis, fibrillary type of gliosis. You can see it along uh, in many processes. Here you have a little bit of an increased density. Slight atypia, so this 
can be problematic sometimes. You do have macrophages again, here you're sprinkling around. And again, when you see that, start thinking that this may be something non-neoplastic, even if you start seeing ATP in some of the astrocytes. You see other areas here, an increased infiltrate. Again, you start seeing here now more of these a gray matter that is not as involved as the white matter. So we're seeing a process as the previous one, uh, not as clear, but that is probably more white matter predominant. Now you start seeing the constituent cells. You see more in, com in contrast to the first case, increased variation in nuclear size and atypia. Now, something that is very interesting here, you start seeing these cells here that catch your attention probably, where you have margination of the chromatin. They're mostly spherical. Right here, right here. Right here and right here. So this is viral cytopathic effect. And in a case like this, in which you have involvement of the white matter, the main consideration in, the, in association with the macrophages is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is an infectious cause of demyelinating disease. As you know, this occurs in patients that are immunosuppressed, uh, particularly in the, in the, in the context of, uh, of HIV infection. And it's a uh, demyelinating process, macrophage reach. You tend to have more atypia compared to um, classic demyelination. The astrocytes can be very typical in some instances, but the viral inclusion is what really makes you think about it. Something important to note, some stains that you can use, of course. Um, this is P53. And at first glance, this scares you. If you're going in the direction of tumor, this may even push you more in the direction of tumor. This is the same case. Strong P53 stain, in particular, those have normal nuclei. So that can be very worrisome. And it's a important pitfall, actually, in surgical neuropathology strong p53 staining in those abnormal cells this is ki67 if you see this again if you are concerned about the atypia you stain it with p53 you're staining it with ki67 the surgeon tells you you know we're concerned about a tumor this is a big mass it's very easy to go that direction this is a ki67 that you may encounter in a tumor for example so this is an exception uh, on, on these macrophage rich lesions in which you can have very strong P53 staining and K67 staining and still be non-neoplastic. This is completely compatible and actually very useful in the diagnosis of PML uh, prior to identification of the pathogen. Now I want to show you another example of uh, PML. This case is a bit more challenging. It's still, you can see, and you may start thinking about something really non-neoplastic, but here you're starting even to have some involvement of gray matter. You see, this is a neuron here, another neuron here, and inflammation. So this is more challenging for to reach a specific diagnosis. This is a case that is very sometimes easy to miss. You have, you at least are going in the direction of something reactive. Um, but this is a slightly different pattern that we are seeing with the first diagnosis that we saw. There are some plasma cells around, some chronic inflammation.
very tricky case. But it's also a patient that was immunosuppressed. You do the P53. Not as much as the first one, but you do start seeing a few larger cells that are positive. And what is helpful here is the SV40. So you see, you start seeing inclusions here. So this is a case of PML. Now, this is the, unfortunately, the pattern that we're seeing not uncommonly now is with in particular patients that have immune reconstitution, you have, you can have PML uh, in the context of, of recovering immune, the immune system, you will not have as, the nuclear inclusions will be very subtle and it's very easy to miss as a, just a typical inflammatory process. A lot of things that we don't associate with PML, gray matter involvement, inflam a chronic inflammatory infiltrates, lack of uh, overt nuclear inclusions, you will see them here. So my recommendation is when you have a odd inflammatory process in a patient that you know is immunosuppressed, or even sometimes you don't have that history, throw a SV40 or some sort of, uh, think about it at least. And occasionally, like in this case, you'll be surprised. SV40 is completely negative in normal brain and in all the mimics. So this is, you see that there's a lower density of nuclear inclusions here. And uh, this is actually PML as well, but in a patient that probably has a lesser degree of immunosuppression, that we tended to see, you know, 10, 20 years ago in, in, in more on the start of the HIV epidemic. So this was, a, these two cases that I showed you are progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's an opportunistic viral infection of all oligodendrocytes and other cells in the CNS by JC virus most frequently encountered in eight patients or patients that have severe immunosuppression. It's important to know that not always, you don't always have this history. So it's always very good, important to keep this in mind uh, that this, the diagnosis of AIDS may come after, may come uh, days after. They, sometimes I've, has, I've seen patients that they say they have this lesion, they biopsy it, you ask them about immunosuppression, they tell you no, and then they do a bone marrow and the patient has lymphoma that hasn't been diagnosed. So uh, occasionally also you can have it in patients that are taking um, iatrogenic immunosuppression for a variety of inflammatory syndromes. And also with advanced age, we have seen a few cases also on patients that are uh, in extreme old age, 80, 85, that develop this without a, a concrete evidence of immunosuppression. But there the presumptive Ideally, of course, is that the patient, the immune system is not working as well as it was in, in younger years. It's a white matter disease. This is actually a looks so fast blue with crystal violet, and you can see the white matter here is completely gone. I want to highlight this. In PML with immune reconstitution or lesser degrees of immunosuppression occurs in HIV patients after heart, unusual histologic features with chronic very vascular inflammation, unusual radiographic features. They may even have enhancement or in a lot of other uh, more uh, confounding uh, features, and they may have a, a better survival uh, than classic uh, PML, which is associated with a, with a horrible uh, clinical course. So we'll move to the next case. 74-year-old man with a lesion in the right cerebellum. So you know that you're dealing with the cerebellum here. You have an inmost unmistakable histology of the cerebellum, the granular cell layer. the row of Purkinje cells and the molecular layer. So that histology is undistinguishable, uh, so very unique. Now, if you look around, what we're starting to see, this is something we're seeing these guys here. 
well-formed granulomas. Well-formed granulomas. Multinucleated giant cells. Some of these are, as so you can see, they are involving the leptomeninges, and they are also trickling down in the perivascular spaces. So, another one here. Numerous well-formed granulomas involving the cerebellum. So this one, we can term it non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation consistent with sarcoid. So the Adjective consistent with sarcoid, I am very care careful about using it. In fact, I prefer not to use it many times because, when you know, granuloma, in, in, depending on your context, you oh, it's very difficult to really exclude an infectious process. So if you are living in a, a geographic location with a high prevalence of, of tuberculosis, you may even be less uh, tempted to use it even less because it's very difficult to exclude even if you don't have the necrosis that possibility so sometimes i add sarcoid if i'm very if the clinical picture is very clear as you know you can have cns manifestations in the absence of pulmonary disease i think it's about five percent of sarcoid can involve the cns without uh, manifestations of um pulmonary or extra cranial disease so it's something to uh, have in mind. And of course, you do all the stains. Now there are technologies that are increasingly being used, uh, particularly in frozen tissues uh, or CSF, in which you can do pan sequencing for microorganisms. It's not used in every case, but that can also uh, in uncover unsuspected infections. So the idea here is that you have non-necrotizing inflammation and you have to use a lot of clinical correlation. This is another case of sarcoid that is, was a case actually that we published a number of years ago when uh, I, we saw this in frozen section. The surgeon could not believe that this was not a tumor and sent a lot of sections for, for frozen section. And you can see why. And I want to show you this because this is a very good example of a pseudonoplastic lesion uh, that is difficult to distinguish. The surgeons felt that was very fibrous, was really convinced that this was a meningioma. And we kept seeing non. Um, non-necrotizing granulomas. And here is the histology of that case. So very similar, a lot of, this was a even more classic, had a lot of fibrosis and well-formed granulomas. And, and this was actually sarcoidosis presenting with a tumefactive lesion. Sarcoidosis tend to, as other granulomatous diseases of the CNS, to involve, this, uh, to have a predilection for the skull base, sometimes anteriorly uh, in the, uh, can involve the hypothalamus. So these are, this is something that uh, to have in mind. It can present as a single, lesion extraaxial mimicking uh, CNS neoplasm. Let's move to case number four. This is a very uh, interesting case that we saw um, um, earlier, 67 year old woman that uh, this has a bit more extensive uh, medical history has hypertension, hepatitis C, had progressive uh, worsening headaches and photophobia, presented to the hospital for sudden onset slurred speech and diagnosed with a transient ischemic attack. MRI was negative for ischemia and she was discharged and found stuporous were admitted a week later. This is the MRI. And you can see particular T1 with contrast, you have enhancement of the leptomeninges. It's a subtle finding, but you see all this white here shouldn't be there. That tells you that the meninges are enhancing. You have also some abnormalities in the cortex. 
And diffusion, you, this is, you have a normal diffusion telling you that there is some, uh, probably some end organ injury to the brain. The patient was treated for potential meningitis, uh, HSV, developed seizures, admitted to the intensive care unit, and brain biopsy. Had progressive stupor, high fever, intubated for respiratory failure, progressive decline, uncle herniation, declared brain dead, extubated, and died three months after onset of symptoms. This is the autopsy, the brain and autopsy. You have a lot of mass effect, a lot of cloudiness in the leptomeninges, some uncle herniation, mass effect, and edema. You can see it's very, a little bit difficult to distinguish the grave from the white matter. And this is a section in autopsy. And you can see a low power. The main finding, you can have this thickening of the leptomeninges that it is goes well with that gross appearance at the time of autopsy. If we go there at higher power, you can start seeing multinucleated giant cells a lot in some chronic inflammation. You do have, again, reactive gliosis. You can see here these reactive astrocytes in the cortex, kind of keeping their spaces. They have a lot of processes. And this is a good follow-up to the previous case in which you have, of course, some giant cells involving leptomeninges, involving the perivascular spaces, but more so, more even than involving the perivascular spaces, they tend to be associated with the vessel wall itself. And this is a pathologic process that is unique to the CNS. You can see some thickening of the vessels, some hemosiderin deposition. Giant cells. Giant cells here associated with the wall of the vessel. And you see here in this particular example, the vessel is kind of a little bit pink. This is actually amyloid angiopathy. And what you're seeing is a reaction to the amyloid in the vessel wall. And this is called a beta related angitis. It's basically an immunologic reaction to the to the amyloid deposition in the vessel. This technically did not present with a mass, a big mass or or anything. But uh, I wanted to show you this uh, for two reasons. One, to to highlight the differential diagnosis with sarcoid that we saw before, and also to show you that always it's important to think about amyloid angiopathy. You have, can have a spectrum of diseases that can be associated with it. Many times you know that this represents with as uh, multiple hemorrhages, most commonly in older adults, but sometimes you can have a mass. It can present as a mass and be biopsied. And the leading consideration many times there is to exclude a tumor. And we have seen cases that of amyloid angiopathy in which the patient goes to biopsy and, and the clue there is so you basically see nothing many times. You just see a, almost a normal brain and sometimes it's a big piece and you start thinking about it. Then you look at the vessels and you see a hand and, and you do the stain and, and make the diagnosis. So you can have many of these lesions can present with masses uh, and it's really uh, important to have amyloid angiopathy in the um, differential diagnosis of many of these masses. Here, you're starting to see some associated infarction with this. And it's important to know you have, is another infarction, so it's another macrophage-rich lesion, particularly when the infarct has a few days, is a few days old. You start seeing this capillary hypertrophy, some red neurons. So you have a vascular lesion here with, macroph with macrophage infiltrates superficially. So this is, chronic inflammation, and again, you, uh, uh, subacute infarct, 
a lot of giant cells associated with vessels. Another example there. So the diagnosis here again was A beta related angiitis, sometimes abbreviated ABRA by neurologists. So it's a vasculitis really associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Uh, more often associated with multiple parenchymal lower hemorrhages, your classic amyloid angiopathy in other patients or in the context of familial syndromes may also is the same type of uh, amyloid deposition A beta that you see in the context of Alzheimer's disease may also present with infarcts or edema. So it's something to really have in mind, particularly in biopsies that look almost normal, mild perivascular inflammation and microglial activation. It's being, a beta angiitis has been increasingly recognized in recent years. Again, it's the combination of the cerebral amyloid angiopathy with granulomatous inflammation, angio destruction, chronic leptomeningeal inflammation. And compared to patients with conventional cerebral amyloid angiopathy, patients with ABRA tend to be younger and have fewer hemorrhages and a better outcome. Now, moving into case five, we have a 52-year-old woman uh, with several lesions involving nerve roots in spine. And this is what you have. Uh, definitely abnormal. You have this bluish material, somewhat cellular, you can see, but some hypercellularity at the periphery of these little lesions. They are almost reminiscent a bit of chondroid material, but not quite, it's not well-formed cartilage. That's one of the clues for this lesion. You have overt bone formation. You actually may have here, you have some gliosis at the periphery, maybe. relatively well demarcated. So this is a good example of calcifying pseudoneoplasm of the neural axis. It's a lesion that you encounter every once in a while. Mass effect, it can occur anywhere in the neural axis. So sometimes you see it in the spine, you can see it in the skull base, you can, they can be extraaxial or intraaxial. You can see it in the brain parenchyma proper. Usually they tend to be in the midline, but you can see it in, in many different contexts. In some instances, they can be associated with another lesion. So there is a there are presumptive non-neoplastic lesions. Now, nobody has done any sequencing or found any alterations, but many of these reactive lesions, as you know, in soft tissues, uh, there is with increasing capabilities, uh, a um, molecular alterations of true neoplasms have been uncovered. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is the case with with these lesions as well sometime in the future. Calcifications, again, the main thing is you do have this chondro, almost chondro-like material, but it's not real true, true cartilage. You usually don't see hyaline cartilage. You have this polysetting around. Sometimes you have multinucleated giant cells at the periphery, and you can have ossification. So those are some of the, the features that uh, allow to, you to recognize it. Gonna show you another example. The, the previous one occurred in the spine. This one actually occurred in the brain. You can see you have some calcifications. This one was much more calcified. You can see all these calcifications actually extending into brain parenchyma.
And something that is very curious as far as the immunophenotype is that those, the palisades around those uh, acellular nodules tend to be EMA positive. So occasionally this get mistaken for um, a, a meningioma. They tend to be EMA, but particularly at the edge of those nodules. So the cells are, for whatever reason, uh, frequently EMA positive. So it's a useful immunostain uh, if you are having a, a differential uh, diagnosis um, to consider. So this is a calcifying pseudoneoplasm of the neuraxis. Moving to the next case, 10-year-old girl with a left temporal lobe epileptogenic focus, a patient with epilepsy. And this is, of course, many times in these uh, seizure cases, of course, what they are trying to do is to remove the epileptogenic focus. And of, histologically, it's important to exclude neoplasms and other lesions can be, that can be responsible for that. And that's what we're doing here. We have a very cellular lesion. Uh, and what really catches your attention are uh, these big guys here, large cytoplasm, very pink. Evenly scattered. You can argue there's some atypia. And when you see these, uh, something they have an ambiguous phenotype, really. And you can see the cytoplasm is pink, like you will expect to see in a glial cell. But the nuclei starting in areas have finer chromatin in, in a prominent nucleoli. So they, you have almost a, a hybrid phenotype between neurons or glial cells. Something the cells are sometimes described as uh, you don't know what they want to be. Uh, and very glassy cytoplasm and tend to be a pro, a positive for neurofilament protein, invariably for neuronal glial markers. Here is uh, the actually involving um, part of the white matter. And these cells tend to be oftentimes located. This is a very florid example of cortical dysplasia, actually. And these are known as balloon cells. It's one of the hallmarks of these cortical dysplasias that are uh, identifiable as a lesion on MRI. So they can go after them surgically. It's a very florid example. And these cells tend to occur in the cortex, but also commonly in the interface between the gray and the white matter. Subtle forms of cortical dysplasia are very difficult to recognize because they are characterized by uh, more subtle alterations in the cortical architecture, but this is the one that it has a morphologic over um, character that are easier to recognize in surgical specimens. Surgical specimens many times are poorly oriented, so mild architectural abnormalities are difficult to, to really characterize, but this is a real nice morphologic correlate of uh, cortical dysplasia, which are these balloon cells. There are different grading systems for cortical dysplasia. This has been historically known as focal cortical dysplasia, uh, Taylor type 2B, which is characterized by definition uh, by containing uh, balloon cells. Next case is a 10 week old baby girl with also seizures. The MRI showed a right frontal lobe lesion with multiple ra radial migration lines within the bilateral brain hemisphere. So in contrast to the previous one, this is a more diffuse process. So 
the surgical specimen. And you can see you have some neurons that are abnormally clustered. Abnormally clustered. More cells with a glassy cytoplasm. When you see this for the first time, you can start even considering a tumor. They're abnormally clustered. You can mistake these for gametocytes, but again, they're larger. They have this glassy cytoplasm. More here. When you see this, again, a high power without knowing anything, it's very easy to go in the direction of tumor. But the cells, some a clue, they have this very nice glassy cytoplasm, very similar to those balloon cells that we were looking at. Here, the preoperative impression is very important, and the clinical, good clinical history is very important. The history of seizures help, of epilepsy. Um, So very abnormal cortex and underlying white matter. So this is actually a cortical tuber. It's a, in a patient, a young patient that has tuberous sclerosis. Looks again, has a lot of features that overlap with um, focal cortical dysplasia, but it's a more diffuse process. And sometimes you do have other uh, findings on clinical exam that will lead you in the direction of the right diagnosis, which is tuberous sclerosis. As far as neoplastic manifestations of this in the CNS, the one of the hallmarks is the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma that occurs inside of the ventricles and it can have cells that are fairly similar to the ones that you're seeing here, but it's more of a true neoplasm. So it's a cortical tuber in a patient with tuberous sclerosis. Next case is a 30-year-old male that had, uh, this is how it came. This came to me as a consult as spinal tumor. Very, no other, no additional clinical information. And you can see it looks like a mass, really. And if you go in high power, you start seeing an increase in collagen density. Certainly, you might think about a mesenchymal lesion of some kind. You have a few atypical cells in between. Something that is important to know, you also have some peripheral nerve fascicles, nerve twigs going through it. Some collagen. So a very disorganized mass. And if you start seeing this here, the serpentine pieces, they look like CNS type of tissue. A lot of collagen, again, some chronic inflammation. More chronic inflammation. We have some stains for you.
this is synaptophysin. You can see most of a lot of that is mostly collagen. Actually, it's not highlighting very well. This didn't seem to didn't work very well. This is neurofilament protein. And you can see it's highlighting many of those nests as well as probably axons. So you have a combination of nerve twigs and CNS type of tissue. This is EMA. So you can see a lot. Uh, this is subtle, but you have this linear staining. This is not artifactual. You do have some admix, meningothelial type tissue, and perineurium. This is the perineurium around some of those nerve twigs. So there's an increase of um, EMA positivity again, again around peripheral nerve fascicles and in the substance of this lesion. And here is the GFAP, which I found very useful. It highlights those nests that we were trying to characterize that are actually a mixture of gliotic cells and possibly of central nervous system origin. So again, this case came with very little clinical information. So the next step here is to do a very good clinical pathology correlation. And we ask for more history or at least imaging. So in these cases, imaging is very uh, important. So this was a uh, call. We got the reports of the imaging after the case. And, and this was, they described some hypoplasia of the thoracic vertebral bodies in the vicinity of this lesion with absence of T9 vertebral lamina. So they were feeling that this was consistent with an atomic variant of sp spina bifida occulta and association with this soft tissue lesion that probably was what was resected that was compressing the epidural space and displacing the, the thecal sac. So you do have a congenital anomaly of the vertebral bodies in association with this mass and the diagnosis was uh, congenital abnormality consistent with some uh, neural tube defect. Of course, the precise type of defect, many times in a surgical specimen, you will not necessarily lead to you to it. It will add to the information that comes from very good uh, assessment, clinical assessment and radiologic assessment for this lesion. The main, main important thing is that this came out as a lesion felt to be uh, a tumor and uh, histologically, at least in their first impression. So that is the main thing here, the main, your main goal here is to make sure that you convey the information that this is something probably congenital and non-neoplastic. Moving into case number nine, this is a 15 year old girl that had recurrent generalized seizures and the MRI show an intraaxial lesion that was calcified and non-enhancing. You can see here at intermediate power that the lesion is densely calcified, a lot of calcifications. Somewhat cellular in areas. And you see this is a lesion that is really inside of the brain. It's a, a parenchymal lesion involving gray matter. surrounding vessels. Surrounding vessels in other areas, very linear arrangement and trapping CNS. 
And if you go on high power, you tell me what, what are these cells here, they do have some cytologic appearance that suggests meningioma. They're oval, there's no well-formed uh, uh, junk, very bland, but we are inside of the CNS. Here you have an entrapped neuron and another one and another one. And you have these very cellular perivascular involvement. So this is, and in the context of seizures, superficial lesion, this is highly characteristic of meningioangiomatosis. So I group this with the non-neoplastic lesions with some caveats, of course. And the caveat is that this can sometimes we phrase them this way, spindle cell proliferation consistent with, depending on the clinical scenario. And the caveat is that you can have a variety of spindle cell lesions that can really present uh, with this type of pattern. So a particular meningioma. So sometimes you have this meningiomatosis that is can be next to a meningioma or associated with a meningioma. And if you study those molecularly, probably um, this, those are clonally related. So maybe just a curious pattern of involvement by, by meningioma of the CNS. Uh, these lesions tend to be associated with NF2. So it's another lesion that frequently occurs in, in this is associated with NF2 patients. It's not diagnostic, of course, of the syndrome, but it's one of the lesions that they can develop. Um, so, it, and it's frequently associated with, with seizures. They tend to be limited to the cortex and to be calcified. Those are some other, other features that I, I showed you in that previous case. But you can have other lesions, sarcomas, even low-grade sarcomas, that can present with this uh, meningiomatosis type pattern. So something to really have in mind. The cells tend to be meningothelial-like, but sometimes the EMA may be negative, so they may be more fibroblastic in, in, in phenotypes. So those are some other things uh, to have in mind. It, this requires very good clinical correlation, really. All right, so let's go to the last case, which is a 23-year-old woman with a history of headaches and the MRI showed a 2.3 centimeter cystic mass with a mural nodule in the left cerebellar hemisphere. Okay, it looks like the slide for whatever reason is not showing, but we have the actual H and E here. We are again in the cerebellum. Cerebellum, a lot of fragments of cerebellum here. And something that you start seeing is glial cells or astrocytes and some rosenthal fibers. So, of course, when you have a presentation like that, the first consideration is whether you have a pilocytic astrocytoma, right? Cystic mass cerebellum. But here you have only 
is the compact pattern uh quite a bit quite a few horizontal fibers and really this is the actual lesion here and this is very easy to miss as well sometimes miss completely and you have something that's slightly different a bit vacuolated sometimes it's easy to dismiss very vascular and here you see next to it you have these so even though most of the fragments are cerebellum and pyloid tissue like you're seeing here the real lesion is here and this is a hemangioblastoma so i place this in the category of pseudonoplastic lesions you do have a neoplasm but the idea here is that pyelogliosis is a frequent problem that we deal with in surgical neuropathology and it's a reaction that can occur around a slow growing tumor so and maybe the only thing that is biopsied so it's something to really have in mind when you are tempted to call something pyelocytic astrocytoma when you have only the pyloid component or the compact component that certainly is always a consideration, something to have in mind. Of course, if you have other components of pyelocytic astrocytoma, like microcysts in a more loose areas, those tend to be more typical of pyelocytic astrocytoma. You don't see that usually with pyeloidgliosis. But always look around, and the true uh, neoplasm may not be always uh, evident. To confirm it, a very nice stain for hemangioblastoma is inhibiting. And you can see it here, how it highlights, inhibiting A highlights this hemangioblastoma. Hemangioblastomas are more common is in adults in the, in the cerebellum than pyelocytic, something to also have in mind. So this is, and you see most of the lesion is fragments of cerebellum, and pyeloglyosis, really. And so this was hemangioblastoma with florid pyeloglyosis. So gliosis is really a non-specific reactive process. It's not normal. So when you have an interoperative uh, assessment to make and they tell you it's normal or not, yes, gliosis, when you see it, is pathologic. But it's not necessarily specific. So you can see it in, in the context of many different injuries to the CNS, both neoplastic and non-neoplastic. It's among the most common things that we see in, neuro, in surgical neuropathology. It's mainly of two types. The one that I just showed you that was pyloid and the defibrillary or subacute that we saw in the context of other non-neoplastic lesions like uh, demyelination. Pyeloglyosis is a chronic reaction developing around slow-growing tumors or lesions. So this is something, again, when you see it, have in mind that you can be dealing with something that is not appropriately sampled. And the hypothalamus, the classic association is with craniopharyngioma, in the cerebellum, hemangioblastoma, the spinal cord, ependymoma, syrinxis, and the differential diagnosis, of course, is with pyelocytic astrocytoma. This is a case of a craniopharyngioma, you can see here, uh, with a lot of pyelogliosis. This is a high power view. If I show you this and I tell you this is a classic example of pyelocytic astrocytoma, maybe uh, most of you will not argue very much the clue here is the wet keratin and sometimes the pyelogliosis may dominate the pattern this is i think it was a, another neoplasm i think an ependymoma as well so you can have the pyelogliosis denominating the scene in the hypothalamus you can have only a few needed uh, nests of wet keratin and maybe the only clue that you have that you probably are dealing with a craniopharyngioma and not with a pyelocytic astrocytoma With that, we can move into some multiple choice questions for the session of highlighting different things that we discussed. So let's start with one non-neoplastic CNS lesion is characterized by high P53 and KI67 labeling indices, calcifying pseudoneoplasm, IgG4 related disease, multiple sclerosis, mycobacterial pseudotumor, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. I'll give you a few minutes or a few few seconds.
end it. Diagnosis is progressing. Hello? Oh, no, no. Five is coming up as answers from many. All right. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is the case. So that is actually a clue. When you see something that's macrophage rich with some bizarre cells and they label with P53 and K67, your number one consideration should be progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And then you can clinch the diagnosis uh, looking for the virus either with a surrogate like SB40 immunostain. That's what I use in my practice. Or you can use other, you can use JC immunohistochemistry for JC virus that is more specific or inside to hybridization. Next question, what is the finding most characteristic for A beta related angitis? Amyloid nodules, fibrinoid necrosis, leptomeningeal chronic inflammation, multinucleated giant cells associated with vessel walls or neutrophilic infiltrates in vessel walls. So what are we seeing for answers? Four is coming up. Excellent. So this is multinucleated giant cells. And even more specifically, they are associated with amyloid deposition in these vessels. That's the pathogenesis of this. You have these giant cells chewing up the walls that are uh, full of uh, A beta amyloid. Which immunostain is frequently positive in calcifying pseudoneoplasm? of the neural axis, EMA, GFAP, IDH1, OLIC2, or P53. All right. <clears throat> and the answer is EMA. So this is a very useful stain. Those polysetting cells at the periphery of those nodules, as I showed you, are frequently EMA positive. It's important to not uh, uh, mistake these for meningioma, which can have metaplastic, uh, there's a metaplastic subtype of meningioma. You can have cartilage in meningioma, you can have bone. This is uh, a different uh, type of lesion. Focal cortical dysplasia tailored type 2B is characterized by an abnormal laminar architecture, association with neoplasm, balloon cells, neuronal binucleation, or TP53 mutations. Three is coming up as answer. That's good. So that is really the most characteristic feature. You do have, of course, an abnormal laminar architecture, like lesser degrees of, of grades of, of this cortical, cortical dysplasia. But the most characteristic, what really distinguishes is the presence of uh, balloon cells. And uh, you usually, typically three mutations are not a feature. Some, uh, Focal cortical dysplasia have been found to have P10 mutations, for example. So they do have mutation in some cases, but not of P53. I believe this is the last one. 40-year-old man presented with a cystic mass in the cerebellum. A biopsy demonstrates a moderately cellular proliferation of astrocytes with numerous horizontal fibers. The most likely association is with the following. Alexander disease, diffuse melanglioma, H3K27 and mutant, ganglioma, hemangioblastoma or roset forming glioneuronal tumor. I think hemangioblastoma is coming up by many. Exactly. So you can see horizontal fibers probably in all these lesions that I listed. Alexander disease, we didn't go into it, is is uh, inherited disorder that is characterized by germline mutations and GFAP, actually. It can have massive amounts of uh, horizontal fibers. It can form masses 
uh, sometimes, but it's a rare, relatively rare disease. Uh, diffuse midline glioma occasionally, it's more of a diffuse tumor. You shouldn't have horizontal fibers, but occasionally you can encounter um, you can encounter them, ganglioma and herset forming glioma tumor can have horizontal fibers in particular. But in myoblastoma is the most common primary cerebellar tumor in adults. So it's a frequent association with this um, pyeloglyosis. And I think that's all we have for today. Um, I wonder if, if there are any comments um, or questions. I'm happy to, to try to address them now or through uh, follow-up uh, interactions. I think if you have time, there is a couple of questions. Um, there is one question from Rayvan. So the question is that, may I ask what caused the increased P53 and KI67 in the HIV associated lesion? Yes, and PML, that's, that's a good question. I think they have, they, it, it's, it's, uh, the cell cycle is altered, is my understanding. So in that case, when you have increased P53 in tumors, it's usually that you have an increase in the mutated P53, which has a, a long half-life. So that's how you detect it for P53. In this case, you do have an increased P53 triggered by these, these cells that are abnormalities in the cell cycle by produced by proteins of the, of the, of the JC virus. Okay, and I think uh, there is another question that I saw, that what is the pathogenesis of PML in the case one? Is it tumor associated or is it something else? Oh, in the first, in the, the case number, uh, the case actually number two, mm -hmm. Um, my, there was case number two. The first one was uh, the malignant disorder, but case number two was um, was a PML. I believe, um, I, I, mean, I think it probably was lymphoma. Okay, okay. And there is one quick, another question. So how can we differentiate alone cells and gemistocytes on H&E? That's an excellent question. So. Uh, gemistocytes tend to be smaller and the nuclei is more clearly astrocytic. So the balloon cells actually have this voluminous cytoplasm. It's much more abundant. It's more glassy when, when you look at it. And the chromatin is, is finer. It's not as coarse as the chromatin that you see with gemistocytes. So it's these cells that, again, they don't know what they want to be. They in some, When you start seeing it, you say, is this neuronal or is this glial and when you do the stains you see the same thing you have sometimes expression of gfap sometimes of synaptophysing strong neurofilament protein that's something that is very characteristic and, and i think sometimes you can even have alpha beta crystalline and other markers but uh, that is they tend to be larger the nuclei tend to be have a finer chromatin one last question any clues to differentiate an abscess from a necrotic glioma Excellent question. So it depends on the stage of the abscess. So sometimes you can have a lot of reactive gliosis around it. Of course, the abscess tends to have more neutrophil infiltrates. That's, you see less that with necrosis of glioma. Um, something that is very characteristic of the abscess when it's organizing is that you start getting a collagenous capsule. And that's a feature that is very useful even preoperatively by the MRI, sometimes they, they can pick up on that by imaging some imaging sequences. You have a formation of the capsule. And histologically, you can start to see collagen deposition, and you can highlight that with a trichrome. Sometimes if you have a very nice section, you can see this layering of, of collagen and a little bit of almost like a like a gradation from necrosis to the, to the layer to the outside gliosis. So that sometimes it's helpful. No feature is 100%, of course, uh, positive. You want to see, try to see, in the case of glioma, the, uh, uh, be convinced of an aplastic component, uh, but you sometimes you can have a, a reactive gliosis around. But a collagen capsule, if you are at that stage, uh, is really something that suggests chronicity and, and is frequently associated with organization of an abscess. I think that's all questions that we have today and the other questions maybe uh, can be answered later offline uh, after the lecture is over. So once again, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for your time and this in-depth effective pseudoneoplastic lesions of the central nervous system. And uh, 
thanks to everyone and all the online viewers for tuning in from different parts of the world. And Dr. Rodriguez, you will be happy to hear that we had viewers from at least 20 countries from around the world, including Dominican Republic, Ghana, Philippines, Panama, Morocco, Libya, Myanmar, Zambia, Turkey, to name a few. Thank you all for your time and tuning in. And just to let you know, the second lecture of the series will be on March 26th. That would be on neuronal and glioneuronal tumors. So stay tuned. And we also have a lecture coming up on March 5th. So that would be a cytopathology talk on molecular cytopathology opportunities, limitations, and pitfalls. And the presentation will be by Dr. Sincita Raichaudhuri, who is from MD Anderson. So stay tuned. And as, as always, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and also tune into our website that is pathologycast.com. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, once again. Thank you very much for your attention.